So this is, this is a fun chat because it's, you know, kind of, you know, this is somebody that I've known for, what, how long have we known each other for? Maybe... Uh, at least a decade. Over when a we decade. Were much younger and... Uh... <laughs> yes, uh, 11, I'd say 11 or 12 years. Um, and I met Pete because, you know, when I was starting my business, I didn't have a lot of role models to look up to. I didn't, I didn't know anyone. Um, I didn't have any... I didn't go to Stanford. I didn't go to a top business school. So I didn't have a network. And I was really fortunate to connect with Pete. And Pete was further along in his journey. So if you look at a lot of what we're doing at Latitude, you find someone that's been on the journey, they've already kind of you know, cut through all the difficult things and they've learned a ton of lessons. So Pete was building Trulia at the time, uh, which for those that don't know, it was a real estate business similar to Viva Real, but in the US. Um, he's been through the entire cycle of pre-seed founder all the way through IPO, and then after that acquisition. So today we're gonna try to cover uh, a bunch of uh, steps in the journey but he was someone that I could just lean on. So it's incredible to have you here, um, you know, and I, I wanna, if you could, you know, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's an incredible event. <laughs> uh, kudos to Latam, to Brian and the team. This is like amazing, so um, it's awesome. Thank you, for, thank you for coming. So we're gonna cover a handful of things. Maybe just first, let's talk, let's talk about NFX a little bit and network effects uh, and a little bit more about what you know, the, the, the firm is doing, what you've, you know, what you've, uh, you know, set out to do. Maybe give a, a quick overview for, I'm sure a lot of you read their content already because, and if you don't, it's some of the most valuable content for startup founders. But maybe just start off by just giving a quick overview. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so we started NFX, kind of the similar spirit. We wished uh, NFX was a seed fund that we always had as founders. So we started NFX about five years ago. Um, really what makes us different is one is we have a team of operators that have founded 10 companies worth more than 10 billion, which I think is more than any other, uh, certainly any other seed fund. We built the biggest seed fund. So in the world, a dedicated seed fund at 450 million. Um, so we lead, lead every deal. Um, and our focus is network effects. So network effects, I'm sure you guys uh, know and understand network effects, but a refresher is that network effects are comp uh, uh, is a property in a company where the more people use that product or service, the better that product or service gets for every other user. So you could think of Uber or Airbnb or Microsoft even, the app stores. So the majority of value in technology companies is created by network effect businesses. So we built them, we scaled them, and now we really focus on helping companies, new founders to, to build amazing network effect businesses. I just want to highlight one quick thing. If you didn't hear him, you know, the first time, largest seed fund in the world, coming down to Brazil, interested in Brazil, investing in Brazilian companies. It's like, where was that when I was starting out, uh, you know, back in 2007, 2008 in Brazil? It was a desert if you were trying to raise capital. So take a moment to, to kind of take that in. And I think it's a good transition for my first question, which is a lot of people, you know, I remember being an American here, people were like, why, why'd you come to Brazil? What's the motivation? Why LATAM? Why, why are you looking at LATAM and what's the interest and why Brazil and, and Latin America? Yeah, so we, so we started um, investing in the region more kind of uh, opportunistically, like probably six months after we started NFX. Um, and, you know, you can detect my accent, British by origin. So I spent half, myself, half my life in Europe and half my life in in the US, and then when we made this initial investment um, in uh, originally in in, this, in um, Colombian Mexican company, um, I came down and checked it out, and I was just um, I mean you've you've heard it today, but um, the talent was um, remarkable, um, and the ambition and the talent, and I think what and once I dug deeper, the the couple of the, the themes that were super interesting to me was. And I, it's easy for me as a European to compare it to Europe because the U.S. is like, okay, the U.S. is big, it's America, but like, where do you want to spend your time? And, and looking at LATAM is like, there's a real lack of incumbency, which means these incredible companies can build, be built incredibly quickly. Um, in Europe, for instance, there was a sort of web 1.0 companies. There's just not that same degree here. So you see companies like New Bank and Rappi and many others just like, accelerate so quickly, which you don't see anywhere else, maybe for a period of time, India, China, but you don't see anywhere in the Western world. Um, 
Secondly, this fragmentation, Julio talked about it, like fragmentation, when you're a platform and, a, and focus on marketplaces, you can provide a ton of value. And then the people are cool and interesting, the climate and the food and just the culture is like, um, you know, I, I love the people and the environment. No, that's, that's, that's awesome. Um, well, you know, let's, I think we should take advantage of the fact that Pete's here, you know, like I mentioned, he's gone through the entire process of starting, scaling, exiting. And so we're going to kind of break this chat into those three, maybe those three sections. We'll start off with, you know, a lot of the founders here are maybe early in their journey and starting out. So I think it's good to kind of double click on a few things related to that. And then we'll kind of cross the journey all the way to exit and talk a little bit more about, you know, part of that. Maybe you could first start off just sharing a little bit more about, you know, a lot of founders, they look at TechCrunch and they're like, or even you see, you know, some of the founders on stage here and they raise large rounds and kind of feels like everyone is doing that, but that's really not the case. What are some non-obvious things that you can share about the fundraising cycle and particularly in the early days? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and break it down and I've been on both sides, right? So I've raised a bunch of money from VCs and now I am a VC so I kind of I'm, I'm sympathetic to kind of to both sides um, so what you need to know is that fundraising first and foremost is about FOMO from the VC mindset is about fear of missing out are you the next new bank or Rappi or next billion dollar company and creating a sense of um, competition hunger you have to be that hot company so that VCs think that like, I just can't miss out. I can't miss out. Um, and, you, and VCs are looking for these, these big opportunities. So, so FOMO, you know, like it or not, is a huge driver in the decision psychology. The other, the other piece is fear of looking stupid. And, and you think of like, um, you know, some of these ideas at the beginning, like Airbnb, like that's kind of stupid. Um, but look what it turned into. So trying to strike the balance of like, of, of like not looking stupid because a VC I've got to pitch to my partners and say like this is going to be the next big thing and the reality is that the next big thing does look kind of like quirky and crazy and you need to help the investor kind of bridge that gap between yes this is a crazy idea but this might just work um, and helping thread that needle what are the proof points what are the data points what's the team build what we call the ladder of proof to help people go from like, yeah, this is a crazy idea, but they've got the team, they've got the passion, they've got the proof points, they've got the early traction, and so you can start to move up this ladder of proof to say, yes, this is, this is a crazy idea that might just work, and that's the kind of stuff that, that, that VCs really love. Just if I may, the, you know, I have the fortune of, we've invested a bunch of companies in Latin America, we've, um, I, I meet a lot of amazing founders in Latin America. If I, you know, the, just some of the tips for folks, because I've, you know, when speaking to US investors, um, a, a couple of suggestions like that, that I would like to see more of and, and probably my peers in the US is like, um, and I had to learn this, like I'm, um, you know, a Brit and I'm like, uh, I study physics and so I'm kind of like, by the way, he has a, a, a degree in physics from Oxford. Just he didn't mention, the, <laughs> but this guy's pretty smart. <laughs> just so, so everybody knows, only Oxford. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, and when I moved to the US and I had to raise money, I had to get rid of this sort of British apologetic, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, like, uh, you know, politeness. Like, in America, raising money is like, you kind of have to be hardcore. You have to show your passion. You are gonna move mountains to make this work. You are gonna do whatever it takes to kind of break through walls to see this. And, you know, and I, and I, and I, and I meet some amazing founders that kind of need to push themselves to like, and it's not being salesy or being kind of like cheesy, but it's like demonstrate the passion. You see the passion inside when you sort of dig deeper, but really drive that passion home. And I heard it from one of the panelists um, on the, the VC panel, like, when you walk away from the meeting and you're just like, you're, you're sort of on, on cloud nine, like you need to think hard about that. And so very simply just show that passion um, that you have. Um, 
I've got a bunch more, um, but like. Uh, let's let's recap. So FOMO, we we everyone knows FOMO. Probably no one's ever heard of Foles. Fear of looking stupid. That's kind of a new concept. So that's another thing to understand the psychology of investors there, and then thinking really big and being. I've seen it in Latin America too, um, where there's like, you kind of, you you know, you want to say you're going to build something really big, but you you don't want to you know seem crazy, but crazy is a compliment, as Linda Rottenberg would say from Endeavor. You know, she's the founder of Endeavor. Crazy is a compliment, and you've got to be a little crazy to be a founder, right? Yeah, because it's freaking hard. You've done it. Like, uh, it's really hard work. And everyone, all the investors know it's freaking hard, and so you need to have this unwavering passion to see it through. So other stuff we see is um, uh, VCs really look for really big ideas. Like, when you understand the the kind of like breakdown of how VCs make money. The reality is that we lose money or break even on most of the companies we invest in. And so few companies um, like Vivreal, like Trulia, that kind of like make a huge difference. And so we need really big ideas. Um, and so it's not, there are, I meet many founders with good ideas, but how can they become big ideas? And pushing hard on that is, is, um, is super critical. And then finally, the... Um, when we see companies which are derivative models of US, um, we get kind of disappointed um, because the very best companies in LATAM and also true in China and India are like maybe, you know, they're either entirely homegrown where they have a very novel take on a particular makeup of the market or they're inspired or influenced in some way by something they've seen elsewhere, but not copycats. Um, you know, LATAM, this region is special, it's different, it's got particular characteristics. And when you, when I meet founders who are like, we studied the global market, this is what we've seen in the US, this working here, but LATAM is different. It's different because of this. And we've tuned our product to satisfy the needs of this market um, and have a particular insight. Then it's like, okay, wow, um, that's super impressive that they've got that and they know they, that they can't copycat the business. Yeah, I think that's an important point because oftentimes I think there was a few generations of companies. Like I, I fell in the generation of like, I got inspired in, in Pete's business. I ended up building Vivral as like the same business as Pete. But the lesson there is, you know, I, I ended up, you know, leaving the door open for my friend Gabriel from Quinto Andar who went in and built more verticalized opportunity. And so, there, you know, you, you, if you just copy what already exists and you don't solve the specific problems in the market, you're, you're going to leave the door open. And I think uh, you can get inspired, right, by those success stories, but you've got to tropicalize and adapt and solve the real problems of those founders. Let's, let's transition a little bit. Um, you know, we're still early stage. Let's talk about hiring for a second. What are some thoughts, the first kind of 10, 20 hires that you have to make? You know, what are some things that people here need to be thinking about, um, you know, in that, in that journey? So I... I've seen from our experience that the, the, the DNA for the company is set in the first like 10, 20 people. The DNA, the core way the, the organization operates. And the challenge is like when you're 10, 20 people and you maybe have raised nothing or a small amount, it's like, it's really hard to hire. Like no one really takes you super seriously. Like, um, uh, and so it's very hard to find these people. And so you kind of have to will them into sell them, convince them. And I, you know, the, the bar that people set is a true indication of where things end up. You know, we've looked at thousands of companies and if they're able to hire great people early on, then that makes a dramatic distance later, but it's hard. And so, you know, while you think to yourself, okay, I need to be spending all this time on building products, being the customers, true. But the, the quality of people you bring on will define, at the early stages, will define a lot of the, the, the future path. And I, you know, I have a, the, the people that I look for and in, in appropriate for startups are generalists. Like, I, I, I have a sort of experience fallacy where the, like, the more experienced the people, the danger, the danger is that you end up building what you're trying to disrupt. So if you're trying to build, you know, whatever the next FedEx uh, for LATAM, don't hire the VP of something from FedEx for your first 10 people. You know, a VC might say, yes, that's a good idea, but it's probably a very bad idea because they're gonna build what they know 
rather than the only way to disrupt FedEx is doing something FedEx would not do. And, it's, uh, and you need to find journalists and, and people that come from the outside looking at this problem to think about it differently. So that's an interesting concept. It makes a lot of sense. If you're trying to disrupt someone, you need someone from the outside. Sometimes it takes an outsider to see a market opportunity that doesn't, isn't kind of corrupted in their thought about because it already exists. And I think another point, just to double down on that, that statement is, you know, I think that a lot of things I see in early stage founders is that they think they're gonna just like hire some flashy executive from an established company, thinking that's gonna help build in and they're gonna be, because they wanna become that. But the reality is you need people, you said generalists, but just people, mao na masa, como se fala in Portuguese, right? Hands on, because in the early days, you just don't know. You, and you need someone that is able to adapt, that's, that can just get their hands dirty. And so I think that's something that's really important in the early days. You need people that are just ready to get it done, ready to make it happen, and just, you know, just adapt to, to those early stage, um, you know, early stage moments, right? And that, and that yeah. And I, I look back at the kind of first 10 people that I hired at, at Trulia, like they, they weren't really skilled in anything, to be honest. But they were awesome people incredibly hardworking, incredibly committed, and athletes that could figure out the problems as they would, as they would come up. Yeah, I'm proud of our team too, by the way, our, our first 10, 20, we, we, we got that yeah. right, uh, as you can see They're by this cool. event. A um, little plug for my team. So, you know, let's talk a little bit, you know, let's, let's go, let's move into scale mode. We, you know, we've only got about 15 minutes left. And, you know, I just want to ask something because like VC, sometimes it feels as a founder, it feel, you feel schizophrenic when you've got you know, the, tw the, the 2021, 2020 kind of like craze of like grow faster and here's some more money and you know, let's, let's, you know, let's keep, keep going, get market share. And then all of a sudden it's like snap back to reality where it's like, all right, now cut costs and let's, you know, let's make sure we get to profitability. So, you know, as a first time founder, I remember paying a lot of attention to what my investors would say and because I was insecure and, you know, the imposter syndrome is real when you're starting out because you haven't done this before. What's your kind of overall advice? How much should you take in from your investors when they give you advice about building the business? Well, I, a lot of my perspective is driven from my experience. So in 2008, uh, we were running a, an online real estate company in the US. And everyone knows what happened. The mortgage market collapsed, the housing market collapsed the economy had collapsed. And, you know, we had investors that were giving this, you know, similar advice you see today is like, cut costs, get profitable immediately, um, because the world is coming to an end. And maybe I shouldn't say this, but I kind of ignored the VCs. Um, so, um, so, uh, so they, I mean, you know, we were, we were part of, um, uh, you know, Sequoia and Axel were invested in us, and they were giving generic advice because they were fighting their own fires. And at, at the time, we had enough confidence and importantly enough cash, frankly, to, um, to kind of realize, okay, we need to, we need to, we, we can't, you know, it's, it's, you know, some of the psychology is like, it's not playing to win, it's playing not to lose. You cannot play not to lose. You have to play for win, to play to win. And, you know, we heads down, sure, we, you know, in the sequence of these things, like, do you cut fat, do you cut muscle, do you cut bone? Our VCs were carrying out, encouraging us to maybe get into the muscle. We're like, no. Okay, sure, we're going to cut some of the fat. Um, and everyone has them. Um, you know, like, <laughs> so, uh, so you, and then you, and then you get, um, but we left it at that. And like, let's, and let's try and figure out how to invest in growth. So, um, that's what we did. And I think there's, you know, for founders in the audience, look, you have two main objectives. One, don't run out of cash. And if you feel that you're in a good business, the market's receptive, you can raise money, great. Don't, and don't misjudge emails from people for fundraising ability. But, you know, look, if you can raise money and, the, and companies are raising money, then you shouldn't be too timid about this. This is a time to be aggressive. And then two, take the market. Like, what did Winston Churchill say? Like, um, never get a good, cr never let a good crisis go to waste. Like, you know, your competitors are like maybe um, have less capital, incumbents are concerned, like inflation. Look, there's so much stuff going on in the market. How can you move faster than the competition, shift your product, 
and evolve. And that's what we did. You know, I, we did that in 2001 when I was in an online travel business. We did that in 2008 in, uh, in real estate, and we came out. So uh, play to win. Don't play not to lose. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback that, uh, you know, I think quoting Senna, you know, on a, on a rainy day, you know, on a sunny day, it's hard to pass 15 cars on the track. And so it might be an opportunity to be more aggressive. Um, what would you, let's talk a little bit about this scaling the role as a CEO and founder. You know, your role shifts a lot over the time, right? In the early days, you know, you, you've got, you know, you've got to focus on a few things. And as the company scales, how would you describe kind of the role, you know, shifting from maybe a product manager to an actual company manager? Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you said it. It's like, how do you, like your, your first job is to find product market fit. And usually it's the CEO or the founding team that's like intensely focused on that, intensely focused on finding product market fit. And, and you have to be the product manager. And then as you shift, you have to be the company manager. And, you know, I, I think that the, the skills involved in being a product manager, which are often about empathy and analytical nature, understand the needs of your customers, interpreting those needs correctly, and then being sort of in the data and details to figure out, okay, they're doing this, we should do that, we should evolve the product this way, are um, actually very helpful to be a company manager. Um, but, the, but many founders are unable to make that leap from being like building product to building companies. And you have to kind of force yourself to do that. And that means delegating, getting out of the weeds, hiring people. And you know, we were first time managers once and like, you know, you, you kind of learn by doing, but you also need to augment your team with people that are awesome managers that have experience to help you create role models for the organization. But it's that, you know, there's companies that need to shift from that product manager to company manager, that's a huge gap. And that's really hard. And finding mentors, finding executives is a key part of uh, making that transition. What do you think the most common mistakes that founders make as they grow the company, they scale, um, you know, as it relates to culture? What, 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 do you, what are the things you see most often that founders need to be aware of and not and avoid? Uh, I mean, we talked about a little bit before, like hiring the the sort of like uh, executive sure. who is gonna who is gonna like uh, come in and try and run the business. I there was a you know there was a situation for me where as I was like I was a product manager and I was trying to move to company manager. Like let's hire a VP of product, and um, we hired a fancy VP of product that worked at amazing places, sort of equivalent today of hiring people at Facebook or Google and like. I said, well, you're, you're the man. You, you know how to do this stuff. Like, it's yours. Um, uh, a little bit of that imposter syndrome, perhaps. And, um, and it was a total disaster. Um, because, because I... What, what happened? What, what didn't work? Well, well I, I, you know, I essentially delegated too much. And um, he went off on... He didn't have the... The, the context of the company, didn't have the context of the data, didn't have the context of the experiments. And so um, I, you know, you need to balance this ability to delegate with a, a high level of curation about onboarding and helping these people to be successful. You can't assume day one as a first time founder that you hire a fancy VP and they're gonna know what to do. Um, so I, I shifted at that point to being a, you know, really to shadow for months and months and months executive like and my job was not to delegate my job was how do I help this person to be the most successful executive in the organization uh, and and that was a sort of big transition in my mind because you're you're wearing so many different hats and the cost of a mistake is so high um, that and so I now like yeah you need to get the right person in which takes enormous effort and then you really have to help them to be, to be successful and, you know, almost to, to a sort of level of detail that is like can take months and months and months. Let's uh, take our last few minutes here and talk about the, uh, you know, the, the exits, right? You know, and, 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 you know, we haven't seen as many exits in, in Latin America that we'd like. 
Um, you know, the, the, the ecosystem is much more developed than it, than it was when I started, for sure. When's the right time to exit as a founder? I mean, you sold your company in what year was it? 2000, what? 2014, 14, 15, yeah. yeah. So how did you know it was time to, you know, to, to take the deal and, and I guess take the money? <laughs> um, and what was the, you know, what, what was, what's, what's a framework for thinking about when's the right time to exit the business? Yeah. So it's, it's really hard, right? This is really hard. And, and, and uh, I don't expect any sympathy, but like, because it worked out well, but it's, but it's really, you don't start a company to sell a company, or at least you shouldn't. You should start a company to solve a big, meaningful problem. And, and then, you know, what happened with Trulia, we got approached by Zillow, which is our number one competitor. Um, and, you know, they'd approached us a number of times beforehand and, you know, we made the decision as a, as a team and as a board that this was the right thing to do. But I can tell you, like, got the call and like, we want to do this and like, no freaking way. Like, um, I don't want to do this. I'm having, I've got a great job, a great team. We're profitable. We're hundreds of millions of dollars, multi-billion dollar company, like no freaking way. Um, and you know, after a period of time, I started to kind of think about it and digest it. Um, and I guess the sort of the framework that I kind of backed into was, was the following, like when you're a sustainable business, like in really options, the right time to sell um, is, I, I say, four key things. So, so one is, is the game, it's what's made you successful in the past, unlikely to make you successful in the future. So let's just say like you're in a, a fintech and everything's moving to crypto and you just don't have that capabilities or you need to be decentralized and you're centralized or it's a web company to mobile or something that is changing. Like, you might want to think about it because uh, the world looks much harder in the future. Um, two is that, um, are you number one in your, in your market? Um, and it depends how you define your market. Um, but the nature of network effects, which all these big companies have, is that the big company, even if you're a little bit bigger, has an unfair advantage over the smaller company. And this is when things kind of shake out and it's mature. You know, in Trulia, Zillow was about one quarter ahead of us. So literally, we were kind of like reporting our quarterly earnings. They were, we were one quarter behind, which is really hard. And as public companies, we couldn't easily just like outspend them because we we're on that, that kind of earnings cadence. Um, three is like if someone's going to pay you forward for execution risk. So like you look at, what is it, uh, the Figma deal that was announced just last week, it's like $20 billion. Um, and I don't know the, the financials, but it feels to me that they were number one, doing awesome, the future. But Adobe came in with it's like, well, okay, that's too good to refuse. We can't turn that down. Um, and then four is um, you're tired. It's burnt out. You don't want to do this anymore. You're kind of done. Um, you know, for me, it truly, that wasn't the case. We were kind of fired up. But if you're feeling that, then, you know, you should think about, okay, should I make a, a CEO transition, which is totally normal, or you should think about the company. But that's kind of how I break it down. And, and um, uh, you know, in retrospect, that transaction was, you know, I came out the other side, like, this is the exactly the right thing to do. We could move our product roadmap forward. We can help to, you know, build a massive platform and, and no regrets at all about it. Well, I have one last question before we uh, wrap up here, and this is a good segue into the next session. We've got you know, a panel of a handful of other global investors with Harlem Capital, Founders Fund, and Andreessen joining us, which is pretty cool to have all three of those investors down here in Brazil. What, how does a global investor look at, and you, know, you don't have you know, boots on the ground, you don't have an, a local team, yet you've made a handful of investments. So what is the process that you take, and how do you find the opportunities uh, to find those potential companies to invest in? Yeah, the, so it's, um, I mean, we, we're a global company, global firm, but we're quite small, and we don't have an office here. So we are, you know, the, you know we, we look at various different guideposts around market, around team and stuff, but we really, 
you know, there, there is a huge amount of signaling we look for. And so really for us, it's like looking at, okay, you know, we speak to our founders and say like, okay, founders are like, like okay, do you know this person? What do you think about this market? Have you heard of them? Um, we look at their angel investors. We look at latitude. I mean, the, we in NFX invest in latitude because quite honestly, like Brian would introduce his company, like that's, they're amazing. Like a lot of these guys here that, you know, we perhaps should have invested in before, like they're amazing. So like that signaling of like, okay, they're uh, backed by these, these famous angels, backed by latitude is like for us that, that kind of key signal. Well, listen, Pete, uh, I just want to say one last kind of word before we transition to the next. Um, you know, for me, it's really special to have you here. I think that it's very symbolic about what's happening in Brazil and in Latin America, where there's people that are kind of lifting up the next generation, right? And there's a lot of people here that are trying to empower the next founders. And this is a guy that, you know, uh, you know from kind of a, a relatively cold message, you know, you know, got an intro and took his time you know, gave me tons of feedback, also kind of got me plugged in and connected. And I think that's a lot of inspiration that we have at Latitude is for you and, you know, you guiding and mentoring me. And so I think that we're really lucky to have you here. Latin America is lucky to have NFX also investing. And we hope you come back and, and uh, you know, and, and, and spend more time down here with us. So thank you for, for being here. Vamos Latam. Vamos Latam. I love it. <laughs>